Welcome back to the PFC podcast. The views and opinions you are about to hear are the speakers and do not necessarily reflect those of anyone else. Now on to the podcast. Welcome back to the PFC podcast. This is Dennis and today I am with Mark. How are you doing today? Not too bad, brother. Appreciate you having me on. Awesome. Awesome. So uh, since this is the first time you've been on the podcast, uh, since you've been newly freed from the military, uh, would you mind doing just a real quick introduction of yourself? Uh, sure. So uh, name's Mark. Just retired about a month and a half ago. I uh, did 25 years in the Navy. Uh, first stint was as a 8404 or just a regular corpsman. Uh, did a little stint as a special boat operator or SWIC uh, when they opened that up to HMs. <clears throat> kind of decided that uh, after a couple of years, I wanted to try something different and then went to recon, uh, did uh, first recon, first force recon, and then moved up to first Raider battalion after a while. Uh, met you over the years, that refresher a couple of times, and then I came out to the schoolhouse. Uh, it was the Sockham NCIC for a little while. That's where I think you and I got to really know each other. Uh, screwed up, got promoted one more time, and got pulled back up to Marsoc, and that's where I retired. Nice, nice. And uh, the reason why I got you on the podcast is just you have a lot of experience in an area that I don't at all, um, is the maritime kind of experience. Now, generally, I try to avoid water, <laughs> essentially at all costs, <laughs> okay? Um, but, like, what makes this different? You know, and it must be different because the Navy makes it a point to change every acronym to something else because the rest of the Department of Defense is like land based. So, so point well taken. I, I will throw in the Air Force is also kind of difficult in those conversations. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But uh, so the maritime environment, like when you're when you're talking about being on a stable platform or even hypothermia considerations, like you, you kind of have like the worst possible environment for the most part uh, that you're always going to be going through or dealing with. So planning is planning, but you always, you always have those little factors that you got to keep in the back of your mind. Um, we've all dealt with, you know, a, a casualty that's bleeding out. We'll now deal with a casualty that's it's dark outside. You're doing your sweeps and the guy's wet as well. So it's just those added little factors that are always always going to trigger in the back of your mind that are you have you have extra considerations to take care of. Yeah, and that water will just suck the heat right out of their bodies very quickly. You know? Yeah. Um, you know, other than like hypothermia, I mean, also there's there is literally nowhere to hide unless you go <laughs> in it. Unless um, you go in it or under it. Yeah. Um, like there's nowhere to hide. So there like T tri C is challenging, I imagine, when you're talking about some kind of maritime operations. Well it's it's the T tri C you gotta think of your, your Kazabak considerations, you know. <clears throat> Say you're doing you know, whether you're coming along the beach, there's decision points like all throughout, which kind of comes into your planning. And if if we're doing like a beach recce and you, you take contact, which you know all honesty, never, never have in real life, but like taking contact or anything like that. But you got to think like, am I going to push in? Did I plan for anything past the hinterland or am I going back out? Am I going to compromise my insert platform? You know, back as like a SWIC guy, like you are the insert platform. You got to think about, am I going to hang out? How much, you know, fuel do I have? There's, it's just a ton of planning considerations. Um, Anything from down to the simplest thing of, you know, is my gear waterproof? You know, it, everybody everybody wants the new new whiz bang med bag, and I dealt with orders like almost every company that would deploy. They wanted something new, and it's like, well, if you've never dealt with the money part of it, like everybody's got a there's a reason why everybody kind of has similar things. Or, you know, is it come which budget is it coming out of? Uh, but then down to your simplest thing of like, you know, your kill card, is it laminated? It's, it's silly things like that, that can make a difference on, on a patient though. Yeah. I mean, how do you, I guess, how do you waterproof your, like, let's start from the outside. Let's, how do you waterproof your bag or do you even bother? 
Well, it kind of depends. Like if there's, <clears throat> if you're diving, they actually have extra like uh, bags you could throw your stuff in. Uh, you could do that. There are some maritime bags specifically that are out there, but just like anything, you you make it maritime, like waterproof or water resistant. Now you're jacking up the price and uh, reselling your stuff. You know, uh, doing the old suction where you're bringing things down that are classable. A lot of the stuff is already waterproof, but like you and I, when we went through the course. Do you remember you kind of crack something open a little bit and buddy tape it? And, well, now did I just open that up to the water or is it still sealed? Do I got to reseal these things? You know, everything from a guy's blow kit to your med bag. Um, plastic's a great thing. <laughs> you know, a lot of, uh, lot of tape around things and uh, just keeping your gear, like PCIs, PCCs, making sure your stuff is in set. It's already set up and prepped for you. And, uh, like you just do the best you can. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And test, test your gear, you know, yeah. for the environment that you're going, going to go into. And I imagine there's a difference between bopping around the surface and actually going subsurface. Yeah. Even just doing a basic dip test, you know, if, if you're talking strictly on water, you know, is your stuff going to float or are you going to sink? Do you have it, uh, neutrally buoyant? Like those are all factors that you got to figure out. Yeah. 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 Um, how does things change? So the way we, at least in for prolonged care and essentially the way I've been doing it since I started being a medic, you kind of plan, you know, what's in my ruck, what's in my truck, what's in the safe house or whatever structure I'm <laughs> going to take this guy to. Like, how does that change with the uh, maritime environment? But again, like you, you still have those same planning factors, but you got to think about what 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 is your actual platform you know are you are you staying in the maritime environment are you just using that as part of your insert you know to get to where you're actually going uh if you're doing some sort of you know like a vbss which obviously everybody's kind of going you know more nsw is doing that now but everybody has trained it at some point like think about what what type of uh vessel you're taking down or you know contacting Look at what else that they may actually have on board, or if there's you're coming from, you know, another surface vessel. Like, what do you have to get back to them? And then just doing that coordination. Um, it's amazing what you can find out about different types of uh, vessels that are out there and what they have. You know, if you're having, I remember a long time ago where we we're kind of training some guys in Africa, and like we're just hitting little bunker boats, but you're out in the middle of Africa, there's really not much out there. So it's like, what are you bringing? What are you going to have on you to actually get you back? And that everybody talks about like, to go on an island. I'm, I'm probably not going to touch that. But if you think in the maritime environment, like if you're in an inlet, how much gas do I have to get back to where I can actually get someone someplace? Um, if you're using a Zodiac, you're really not going to be able to hold a dude there for, for that long. So you start thinking like, well, how am I going to get him off this platform? And everybody wants to do the hoisting and all that other stuff. Well, now you got to think about if you're hoisting someone from the ground. You got to worry about trees, around a building, maybe some antennas. But every vessel's got radar, antennas, you know, all that stuff. And then trying to keep that patient stable if you're actually pulling them off through a, a air medevac. You know, do you have the right taglines? Uh, I don't know how many skeccos I've opened up, and there's it's just the sket. That's it. Well, what about flotation? Well, guess what? That's another NSN. You got to order, <laughs> which goes back to like planning all your stuff, making sure you have all the right gear. Yeah, I, I'm sure. Not to mention, like on land, like yes, you got trees and et cetera, et cetera. That's in your way. Well, now you're dealing with like surf. And surf. Like, the patient itself is going up. Exactly. It, it's the same considerations you have to worry about, like on a fast rope, where you're trying to kind of match it up and meet it. Well, if you're hoisting someone off a bird or off the deck of a ship, it's the same thing. You know, like, have you worked this out with the pilots before? Have you done that prior coordination? Do they, have they ever done this? Um, do they know about the tagline? I've seen some things almost go super bad for not using a tagline. Uh, it's everything's moving and everything's wet. And then getting someone, if you think it's hard to get someone out of a hut, you know, in the Middle East, try getting them up a ladder well. You know, 
do, do you guys know how to use a three to one or a five to one to actually like pull people up? Uh, it's those planning, the logistics, I think it's just, you got to take it to that nth degree. Who's got the ropes? Like where are you, where are you stashing those ropes? You know, are you going to do it on your first breach point? Or are you going to move in one? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's just so many, there's so many little details that are just different than probably you get from most schools, you know, especially when you're talking joint schools, you know, they can't come up with absolutely everything and, you know, seek out those mentors, uh, guys who've been, been in the, whatever unit you're going to, um, who've been there for a hot minute that they can help you understand what these, what is the important parts, what are not the important parts and just kind of help your planning, help your practice uh, so that you can actually be an asset to the team. Yeah. <clears throat> to kind of, kind of go a little bit further on that. Like one of the things I would tell the new guys that would come in, because everybody wants to go to those cool schools or the, the next medical course or, you know, some, the next tactical course, the first thing I always told guys to do is do those basic things that no one really wants to do. That's going to assist you in your job. Like it used to be called on the Marine Corps side, you know, hearse master. That's where you're going to learn how to repel dudes. That directly translates to you getting your, your patient out of there. You know, <clears throat> being a dive supervisor, you know, I, in my side of the community through the pipeline, they come out, you know, trained in dive medicine but you're that one guy and like i would recommend this on on your side of the house too like dmts they, they have a niche like you you got to know that hyperbaric medicine but refresh those skills you know just because you went to the course doesn't mean you shouldn't go talk to that master diver to get your you know get that checklist signed off and you know you're good um even being a like a jump master like be that little asset that extra little step to help your team and then go into the other fun stuff because I'm, I'm one of the big proponents so there's some great you know extracurricular training out there but the schoolhouse produces a fantastic medic you know no absolutely absolutely and every like it's, i think it's just human nature you know you want to go to the advanced schools you want to do the sniper and the breach and the high altitude and like the whole gamut right you want to you know, just bling with tacticalness. Um, but you don't really get to do those things that frequently. You know, become a master of the basics, um, master of your actual profession, and then you can, those 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 billets, those schools, they're always going to be out there. Once you've mastered your job, one, your reputation has probably grown a lot because you're better at it than anybody else. Those other those other schools, that other knowledge, they're always going to be there. Yeah, and don't get me wrong. Like I think all those skill sets should be spread across every team. You know, and don't ever leave your medic out of that because you want him to be just as tactically, you know, proficient as he needs to be. But your real job, like your primary duty, is to be the best on someone else's worst day. Like seeing some guys that kind of lose sight of that, it it always kind of hurt because you didn't. I never wanted to be that guy who's like nope you're just a medic like that's all you need to do because you're not you're a team member be a proper team member but don't ever let it outshine your primary job yeah and that's cross training your guys you know who's <laughs> finding that finding that other guy who's going to be able you know you can count on him to help you with that three to one or that five to one you know and the reasons why you need to you know do this at this time um being assertive, like those new guys that I saw this push in Sockham students. It's like the guys that are wallflowers. I'm like, that's that's not who you need to be. Not a loud mouth, but you got to be able to like look at, you know, platoon sergeant, platoon commander, team commander, team sergeant in the eye and be like, this is what I need. And this is why I need it. Whether or not they can give it to you, that's that's on them. That's why they're leading that team. But they they, they can't lead it effectively without knowing what you need. And like why you need it right yeah, absolutely right um you know it's super tempting to be the gray man because you're more than likely gonna get by <laughs> um yeah. but once you actually pop out the other side 
Like now is the time that you need to um, kind of voice that experience, voice that knowledge that you know this is, for at least this aspect of the mission, this is the right thing to do. That's what you're there for, is to be the advisor. Yeah, exactly. So if you could, um, let's walk through kind of how, let's say, you're doing some kind of reconnaissance, beach reconnaissance. You've gone inland, I don't know, 100 meters, a click, whatever it is, right? You've taken some kind of casualty of some kind. What is kind of the traditional um, plan, I guess, to get a casualty back to some kind of surgical sport? (laughs) Uh, Well, uh, how how do I shape this one? So, so as a, as a primary medic and especially the team commander and team chief, like they're going to, they're going to know where all the different assets are going to locate it. But as that young dude, you got to realize you should be planning by phase line. Um, do you have anything just right off the coast? Do you have something that you planned, you know, further inland? Uh, if it's just a recce, like you're really going to try to get that guy out of there. And that's really your, you know, your compromise. So you're not going to be able to pull that recce. You got to completely shift your mindset, suppress whatever you're, you're dealing with and then getting them out there as fast as you can. Uh, and it really kind of depends on how you got in there. You know, did you, did you dive now? Did you cache your, you know, your scuba or your uh, Mark 25s or whatever? And can this guy even get out of there? Like, do you have to hold in place and, you know, call him for uh, reinforcements or, or what? But that's those planning factors. You got to look at where you inserted from. What, what do they have? Are you going to be able to get a bird in there? Do you have pre-planned HLZs? Do you have another, uh, like a rendezvous point that sea that you can get someone out to? And then what gear are you bringing? You know, if you're doing a recce, you're not going to have, you know, that whole truck. You may have a rock, but you're, you're carrying that. And you got to remember, you got your batteries and ammo, food, water, chow, all that stuff. Um, but you got to be able to spread load your gear to where you can actually get that casualty from the point of injury back to where you, you plan on bringing them. Um, and it's going to be tough because if you, like, say you came in on Zodes and you buried those things, well, now you got to get those things out of there and then get back out. So having a solid, you know, call for fire plan, um, play pre-planned HLZs, uh, doing that prior coordination with, with every air asset and uh, surface asset that can come get you, it, it's, it's key. There's really not, I don't think I'm saying anything new compared to like a, a land asset, but you're, you're kind of further out the dry. You know, you're not going to drive up and have a truck waiting for you. You know, you're still going to be taking care of that patient on some sort of platform that that's moving as you're going. And we've all done the training of like, Oh, let me, uh, let me get in the back of my home and drop an IV on nods as you're going over rough ground. Like that's cool. Now do 47 knots on water and hit a pothole because there's potholes in the water everywhere. Um, it's just those little things where you got to kind of train to and just get used to that environment. And then like we talked about earlier, that hyperthermia is just going to crash that guy really fast. Huh. Hopefully that kind of answers your question, but I mean, it does, um, you know, so, you know, over land, you get them to a place that they can be picked up. Um, let's say, you know, let's pretend, you know, we're link, we're looking forward to this Lisco or just aircraft are just getting shattered out of the sky everywhere. Um, so we're going to have to go by some other means, right? Um, in this case, maybe let's say we're going, uh, uh, on the surface here, is there a is there a better place in the boat? Is one place better than the other? You just throw them in and you start working where you are. Like- <laughs> so, so if so, like an eleven meter rib, a great place where you can actually work is actually on the engine decks. But then you have to worry about there's nothing else there. So, this guy's going to slide off, or you're going to like strap him down. Um, if you're back on the bolster seats, like you have zero room to work, um, the front gunnel potentially, but you know, there's a weapons mount up there. 
uh, there's really not one place, but I, I would recommend kind of that ninja compartment area because then you can actually move a little bit, but you got to figure out some way to tie that guy down. And then <clears throat> we all have, you know, clip-ins, being able to clip in to something to where you're not going to get thrown off a boat. Zodiacs, you've been on a Zodiac before, like there's no room. Like get comfortable guys on the gunnels. Uh, no one wants to do that, but that's why we learn to have one leg off and, you know, you're kind of shimmied on that thing. That way you got a little bit of room to work. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, having treating one guy in a zodiac, it sucks. You know, now you're dealing with if you got to deal with more than one, like now you are in a freaking hurt locker because there's yes. nowhere to move. There's nowhere to move. Everybody, everybody's got gear. Um, it's one of those things where just think about, uh, like a dive school, we used to call them the honeycombs, where they put everybody in the center of the uh, center of the pool as close together as you can to tread water. Like, okay, well now do medicine in that because you're moving at a you know decent rate of speed. Hopefully your your bag's not a yard sale or you're working off your body, which I highly recommend. Um, but then you got everybody else just kind of sitting there and there's always someone that wants to help, but sometimes there's no room. Um. So another idea I've heard, and since I'm only a paddy diver, I guess I will uh, uh, yield to your opinion. But uh, I've heard people are talking about actually being able to go subsurface with a patient. Now, I when I'm thinking of this, I'm thinking of like a criked patient. Um, that sounds to me like a really quick way to drown your patient. So... Yeah, uh, <laughs> kind of like what we talked about in the beginning of this. There's something I don't want to comment too much on, but I think there's some good technology out there to where, because, I mean, if you think about an oil rig, you got people out there forever and underwater diving. There's there's a lot of good technology out there to where, you know, potentially you could, you know, if we have a gamma bag, that's going to kind of, you know, hover someone's pressure in a specific spot that you can maintain. I think there's some companies out there that are looking at ways to take that similar concept and put it underneath underneath the surface, maybe add a little bit of propulsion to it. And uh, I think it's a viable concept. Yeah. I mean, if essentially you're talking about like a, a sub, like a dry inside sub, like, okay, that sounds cool. Um, something that's wet, how like those cuffs are not made for, you know, several atmospheres of pressure like i don't <laughs> yeah uh, they figured it out they might have okay nice 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 well very good we'll skip over that part <laughs> but um you know now transferring so you know you're 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 traveling from the beach going to you know whether that be another ship i think maybe starting to get dangerous um like one like are you are we talking you know a, a couple of kilometers are you talking like 30 40 like how f yeah that's that's a problem that's that's kind of been in the news a lot um you, i mean you touched on it when you're talking lisco uh that's the thing when you talk about prolonged field care in that type of environment you kind of have to you, you'd have to know your limits of like where the offsets are, you know, technology is a hell of a thing. You, you could read in the news of what, what a lot of the major concerns are. You got, you're going to have to be able to figure out how you're going to maintain that patient potentially for a long time. And one of the ways I would recommend is, you, you know, you're doing a, a recon of where you're going into look at anything that's adjacent that could be friendly or abandoned to where you can potentially do uh, like another pre-planned HLZ. It may not be the same same spot that you just came from, um, and you really got to take a look at what gear you're bringing. Like, what what's that dual purpose, you know, triple use type thing that you can still pack on your body, you know, or get dropped into you. I would imagine. Okay, we're if we're coming in on the surface, you have some kind of ship, you have some kind of whatever, right? Or maybe even subsurface where, you know, you have more gear. Essentially, 
you essentially just need to get out of there far enough that whatever weapons they were shooting at you, they can't shoot at you anymore. And essentially now you've got your, your floating house, if you want to call it that. <laughs> <laughs> so not everybody has those floating houses, though. Um, <clears throat> again, without touching on a, a couple of different things, like they were kind of beating around the bush about there, there are some things that, you know, you can meet up to another platform where they're going to have like a nice medical bay. Uh, they're going to have, you know, the bright lights and cold steel. If you're not going to be able to make it to that though, or you don't have that available to you, you're going to have to figure out those other places you can take them to. Um, again, the, the gas consideration, like how, what's, what's your range? What can you actually make to, and all this is really going to come back to that pre-planning we we're kind of talking about. To be able to, it's it's kind of a, an ambiguous question, just because we don't know typically what you're going to be working with, uh, like who you're working with. Is there is there someone out there that you could reach out, phone a friend, uh, someone that can come get you, or who's going to come get you? Now, if we're talking, you know, you got a mew off the coast, and you're you're probably pretty set because they're going to have some sort of surgical team, you know, waiting for you out there. Uh, they're going to have the air assets to come get you. Uh, but I mean, if you're out there alone and unafraid, that's, that's, that's a tough call. And that's where I would recommend really looking at those adjacent areas and what you can actually use to get there. Now, uh, say we're actually getting to some kind of ship that has some kind of medical facility on it. So in the military, they call them surgeons, but they're not always <laughs> an actual surgeon. Um, is that kind of the same in the Navy? Uh, there's that, that does tend to happen sometimes. Um, we all know, I think every military doctor comes in as a general medical officer and then they'll go on to their, their specialties. Uh, that's again, where you're going to have to kind of know who you're dealing with. Uh, when I say fleet surgical team, they they're typically have, so whether, whether or not it's a, a ship surgeon, or a fleet surgical team. If it's a fleet surgical team, yeah, they're going to have surgeons on there. You're going to have your, like, what you need to get to bright lights and cold steel. Uh, but there, there's been oftentimes, I, I got a kind of a funny story where I went to one of those types of ships and I couldn't get this guy's shoulder to reduce. Like, it, it kept subluxing. It kept subluxing. Didn't have any narcs on me at the time. I'm at this pool. And I get him. There's a foreign national, partner nation. I get him up to this ship. <clears throat> where it was planned, everybody was supposed to go to this ship for medical care and uh, trying to convince an OBGYN to push some narcs so I can get this guy's shoulder back in place was, was quite difficult, quite difficult. And I mean, I was, I was in E7 at the time, very confident, very competent. I put the guy's shoulder in probably three times on the pool deck, but it just, it just was not staying. And I didn't have any, uh, any uh, like volume or first set. And that's, Literally all I asked, I was like, hey, man, can I get five megs of Versed? I'll get this thing back in. We're off your ship. Apparently, that's not very common when you're delivering babies. He wasn't really comfortable with it, but we, we managed. We managed. So I would imagine the fleet surgical teams probably mobile unto themselves. Unto themselves. They're, they're typically, <clears throat> if we're talking like a Mew, uh, and this is something you can just, you can Google this, you know, a Mew is going to have like a fleet surgical team, Marine Expeditionary Unit. Uh, but even the new hospital ships that the Navy's trying to push for, like, they'll have pretty much everything you need, whether, whether it's a surgeon, a tech, uh, all the way down to a pharmacy tech. So. I imagine the the, uh, the capacities for these uh, the medical sections of these ships obviously are going to vary for the size of the ship you're getting onto. Um, but is there like a kind of a standard? Is it like a can you have like a closet where we can barely fit one guy in here? Or kind of kind of depends on the the size of the ship. Um, it could just be a surface IDC, all the way up to a full medical department. You know. Um, like the things we were talking about earlier, like they're ginormous, decent medical department. You're going to have a doctor. You're going to have potentially a PA and a nurse, um, especially if they have like a surgical ward. Uh, so it really kind of depends on who you're working with and what you're working off of. So everything from the single IDC to, you know, a full-blown little mini hospital. 
Yeah, I mean, that makes sense, right? Especially depending on, because the, the population on that ship normally is going to vary so much. It only makes sense if that uh, the med department is going to vary so much as well. But generally, each one has a doctor, minus the real small boys where they just have a surface IDC. Okay. Okay. Say so, yeah, I'm brand new, coming into MARSAC, graduated from Sockham. I'm much happier than I am now. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, what kind of advice would you, I'm coming to your unit, what kind of advice would you sit me down and be like, listen, like, this is what you got to know. Uh, <clears throat> so this is what you got to know. Not the typical, hey, keep your mouth shut. You don't know anything. Open your ears. Uh, <clears throat> learn every aspect because some one of the longest patients I ever had to hold on to wasn't even, uh, you know, like traumatic. Dealing, dealing with a clinical injury, like a guy who's just running a high fever in the middle of the desert for no reason. And you can't get them out, and you're still going out on patrols. Like, don't let your other medicine rust. The the trauma medicine super. I won't 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 say easy, and then get you know crucified by a bunch of people. But the basics, the basics. You know how to put on a tourniquet. But keeping your clinical medicine sharp. But then also learning how to plan. We don't teach you that creative way of planning. You know, going through Sockham and everything. But that right there. I think is is a, a it's one of the factors that can actually save or kill someone because if you don't know where you're going to bring them to, who's your adjacent, you know, entities that you're working with, how am I going to get them out there? Kind of all these things we're talking about. If you don't have the ability to look at the bigger picture of what you're doing, take yourself out of that that tactical role and kind of do that three thousand you know thirty thousand foot view of what else is out there, who can I communicate with. That that's one of the first things I think you really need to learn, and it's going to make you a, just a better medic in general. That's that's one of the first things I would tell people. And then, like we talked about with the training, you know, start start training to be an asset to that team, uh, be technically and tactically better than the guy next to you, because you're the medic. You're always going to be looked at. You're always going to be judged. Be better than them. They'll know it. And if you're not. They're going to know that shit too. So um, be an asset, not a liability. Yep, absolutely. And that's pretty universal. You build your reputation off what you do those first days, sometimes yeah. hours. <laughs> sometimes hours. <laughs> <laughs> I had a couple of phone calls uh, before I left of new guys. And they're like, I don't want this guy. I'm like, well, did you try to train him? No? Okay, well, he's your problem till you do. Yep, absolutely. Um, is there anything that we didn't cover that uh, you really like to get out there? Uh, just remember, like the the environment's the environment. Whether you're on land or doing something from a you know mobile platform, web platform, just brilliance on the basics. Keep things nice and neat. Don't be a yard sale, and then just that being able to plan from point of injury back to conus, kind of like we're hinting about knowing where you're going to go how are you going to go and then plan for contingencies i won't say what region but like everybody knows what isos is and i've, I've seen that fail so be able to hold on to someone know where that next echelon of care actually can be and then just keep that you know opens line of communication awesome well thank you mark i really appreciate you coming on uh, it is my pleasure hopefully it wasn't uh too much of a waste of your time <laughs> never never that's it for today's podcast make sure to go to our website www.prolongfieldcare.org check out our free downloads and a ton of other helpful information grab a bag of our fresh roasted pfc coffee links in the description below and stay on the bleeding edge of combat and austere medicine this is dennis for the pfc podcast out out